نحمد و نسلی علی رسول کریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شخلی صدری و یسرلی امری واحل العقدتم من لسانی یفقہ قولی و جعلی وزیر من اہلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین رب زدنی علما اللہم انی اسألکا علما نافعا رزقا طیبا و عملا متقبلا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ Today we will start our discussion of Surah Al-Baqarah from verse number 60. وَإِذْ اِسْتَسْقَى مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ فَكُلَّ ذْرِبْ بِعَسَاقَ الْحَجْرِ فَانْفَجَرَتْ مِنْ حُسْنَةَ عَشْرَةَ عَيْنَا قَدْ عَلِمَ قُلُّ أُنَاثٍ مَشْرَبَهُمْ كُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَعْسَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُفْسِدِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And recall, when Musa alayhi salam prayed for water for his people, and so Allah said, Strike with your staff the stone, and there gushed forth from it, Twelve springs, and every people knew its watering place. Eat and drink from the provisions of Allah, and do not commit abuse on the earth, spreading corruption. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating the condition of the people of Bani Israel in the desert. In the desert, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was merciful and kind to them and how Allah blessed them with heavenly provisions and uh, made a cloud stay above their colony to, prov- uh, to provide them shade. So one of the blessings which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them was of uh, the provision of water. In the desert, When they were living in the desert, there was shortage of water. So, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he, he made a supplication and he made dua. And the dua of Kalimullah was heard and it was accepted and it was granted. So, we need to stop here and we need to revise that duas of the prophets, they were heard, they were answered and they were accepted. So, when we make dua, we should try to make dua in the words of the Quranic dua or the supplications which were made by the prophets and are mentioned in Quran. And what will be gained out of this? Number one, we will get the reward of the recitation of Quran. And then we will also be rewarded for following the sunnah of the prophet. And then we will be making the best supplications, the supplication which was tried, which was accepted, and which had reached the throne of Allah. And another important point will be that we will learn, we will learn how to make complete and comprehensive du'as and supplications. Because when you, you know, when we make du'a, We generally make and we generally ask for incomplete things. We ask for a certain thing and we leave the others. But when we make dua and we make supplications in the words of the Quranic supplications and the supplications the prophets made, they were complete and they were comprehensive. So we'll also learn how to make comprehensive and complete duas. 
So now when Hazrat Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for water for the for his people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to hit the stones or the rocks of the mountain with his stick. Now, if you if you just relate, this did not seem as a probable solution. As Musa was asking for water and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to strike the stone or the rocks of the mountains with his stick, what would this do? But you know the mannerism of the prophets was what? Sami'na wa atwana. That we listen and we obey. Remember that despite the fact that a person may realize that obeying Allah is difficult or it does not seem as a probable solution to his situation. It may, it may not seem feasible and it may sometimes seem very unpractical as well. But still, if the person obeys Allah without any doubt, without any confusion and without any delay and disobedience, then the person will relieve, will receive what? The person will receive the help of Allah and will also receive the blessings of Allah. And this is exactly what happened. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to strike the stones of the mountain with his stick, although it did not seem as a probable solution to the problem, but he obeyed. And what happened? A miracle occurred. A miracle occurred. And just after the mountain was struck, 12 springs started flowing and water gushed out of the rocks. They were granted 12 springs miraculously. And why were they, why were they given 12 springs? Because there were 12 families or there were 12 tribes. So to prevent fighting or disagreement or clashes on the issue of water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with 12 springs flowing out of the mountains. So we learn from here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not approve of mutual fighting and clashes amongst the followers of the prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the followers of the prophets to be united. As Allah says in Quran, Bunyanu Mursus, a consolidated wall, a single consolidated wall, which is constructed and erected to provide protection against the enemies of Islam. And Muslims are, and the followers of the prophets are, are expected to be united, united as a wall, deterring and stopping the anti-Islam forces and agencies. So now, after providing the Bani Israel with water, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to do what? Kulu. Kulu. That you may eat. You eat and drink. Kulu washrubu. Eat and drink from the provisions of Allah. But do what? Do not commit abuse on the earth, spreading corruption. So the message of this order which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made to the people of Bani Israel, after blessing them with all forms of provisions to eat and to drink, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to not to make corruption on earth. Not to commute, not to commit abuse. So the message is that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for someone, He orders and He expects that after receiving the provisions of Allah, the blessed people will refrain from any form of corruption and fitna on the earth. That is, that if a person is blessed with wealth, with riches, with power, with authority, then the person needs to refrain from the misuse and abuse of the provisions and stop from creating mischief. Because mischief is what? In the eyes of Allah, wal fitnatu ashaddu min al qatl. But if we just realize and if we analyze the situations currently, you will see that totally 
contrary to this the current situation is what the current situations are totally opposite to this in the today's world the richer the person is the more authority or power the person has the more mischief the more mischief and corruption the person creates the more he misuses his power and status allahumma la taj'al minhum allah make us not one of those who misuse their power and status and who who create mischief and corruption on the earth verse number 61 وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى لَن نَّصْبِرَ عَلَى طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ فَادْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُخْرِجْ لَنَا مِمَّا تُنبِتُ الْأَرْضُ مِن بَقْلِهَا وَكِسَائِهَا وَفُومِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَثَلِهَا قَالَ ارسلیسلام Musa alayhi salam said, Would you exchange what is better for what is less? Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quoting how the people of Bani Israel reacted after receiving the provisions, the heavenly provisions sent to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bani Israel said, La nasbira ala tu'ami wahid that we can never endure on just one kind of food what did they exactly say they said that they could not do with a single dish they could not do with a single dish they said and they demanded that they wanted and they preferred multiple worldly dishes to the single heavenly dish they were blessed with how how very thankless how ungrateful so this was the behavior and the mannerism of the people who have been labeled and addressed in quran as the maghdub the cursed ones so that is what we need to learn people individuals families societies who are thankless and who are ungrateful may be cursed by Allah then individuals people families societies who are not content with a single dish they behave like the maghdub we need to analyze we need to make self analysis and we need to do self audit where do we stand what are we doing what are our priorities are we content with the single dish our family and meal timings our parties and get togethers our marriage celebrations our iftar meals in ramzan do we limit ourselves to one dish simplicity of meals what what variety of food on our meals what craze of multiple dishes in our functions what obsession what obsession of courses of lavish dishes for showing off for exhibition and demonstration of our wealth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered kulu washrabu wa la tusrafu innahu la yuhibbul musrifin eat and drink but do not be wasteful because there's absolutely no doubt that Allah does not love those who are wasteful Allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatakhirin rabbighfir warham wa anta khayrur rahimin 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us adopt simplicity in our lives. Help us adopt help us adopt simple manners in all spheres of life. May it be our food, our dresses, our homes, our jewelries, our functions, our ceremonies, our get togethers. How simple was Prophet in his lifestyle? And how very simple and humble was he in all spheres of life? Like his clothes. Prophet used to wear, he used to wear and he used to like and prefer, prefer wearing simple white clothes, simple white cotton clothes. And even when these clothes they got old and they they were torn, he used to he used to darn them with his own hands. When his shoe used to break, he used to repair them with his own hands. And Prophet has promised that whoever wears simple dress, whoever wears simple dress despite the fact that the person can afford to wear expensive dresses, then on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the person to choose a dress for himself out of the valuable <clears throat> out of the valuable dresses of jannah so if we think how obsessed if we just compare how obsessed we women folk are about our dresses about designer dresses and how many clothes how many extra dishes dresses do we have hanging in our cupboards and our wardrobes that we don't even get a chance to wear some dresses in a season and then we pack them off for the next season. Prophet he saw his dearest wife as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wearing a golden jewelry although gold is permissible for Muslim women but then Advising and suggesting simplicity to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he advised, Aisha, it would have been better for you if you had worn a jewelry other than gold and you had got it dyed with zafran. So nowadays there's a, there is a race, there's a rat race for all forms of jewelries, matching jewelries and designer jewelries and carrots and the sizes of the carrots of the diamonds. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Prophet sallallahu had gone on a travel and he was going to return after her travel. And just to decorate her house before her husband came back, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she hung a, silver, a silken curtain a silken curtain on the wall or on the door. When Prophet ﷺ returned and he saw this, he saw a silken curtain hanging in the apartment of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. He said, Aisha, these walls made of mud and stone, they are not worthy of being decorated with silks. Where do we stand? Where are we up to? Layers and layers of silken draperies and upholsteries and curtains. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and then Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. She hung a curtain with a picture on the door. You know, Prophet sallallahu routine was that when he came back from a journey, he would go to the mosque, first of all, and there he would offer some nawafil, and then he would go to the house of Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, his beloved daughter. Now, one day when he came and he saw that the door had been decorated with a curtain having a picture, a picture of a horse or something living, he returned without seeing he returned without meeting his daughter and the grandchildren. Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and how when she found out that Prophet sallallahu had gone back without meeting her, she ran to see him and asked, 
asked him the cause of his annoyance and when she found out she went back home and she took off the curtain and she tore it off and the simplicity of the bed of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the bedding of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was just it was just a simple blanket and the blanket used to be shifted to the apartment of the wife whose turn it would be and at night the blanket was f- doubled up and it was just folded up when it was just double as a layer for the bedding of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when one night has a hafsa radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she just thought about prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's comfort she made four layers of the blanket to just make it a bit softer and in the morning when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got up he inquired that why was my blanket folded to make it softer because a softer bed and a softer bedding it is it stops one from getting up early in the morning for tahajjud and for fajr just need to compare the four poster beds and the beds and the beddings and the bread spreads and the all forms of expensive and heavy and luxurious bed linens and all and then we claim to love prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we claim to be the followers of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as regarding the diet it was simple it was simple to the finest extent as a taisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha after the death of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam she was found talking to her nephew Hazrat Urwa bin Zubair رضي الله تعالى عنه and who and she was telling him that my nephew one moon used to come and the second moon used to come and the third moon used to come that is two months almost and we did not light up fire in our stoves and the nephew immediately asked what did you eat my aunt and she very simply she was not complaining she was just informing she said that black thing in water the black thing means what the dates and she added except that on a few occasions the neighbors used to send the milk of the goat and you know what that used to be an ultimate treat for the family of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one day has a Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw Hazrat Aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha eating freshly cooked and freshly prepared food two times a day sometimes i read that three times a day prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam immediately immediately tried to train Hazrat Aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and he said Aisha would you desire would you desire that eating becomes your life that eating and feeding and wanting and desiring to have good food and tasty food being the ultimate and the primary priority of your life where do we stand and how do we decide our priorities in life when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to travel he used to have roasted ground oats for his food how very simple and how very convenient and easy and practical for a journey and there was an occasion when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam visited one of his companions and uh, the companions as a host he served freshly picked dates and uh, the fresh cool water of his well and uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after eating these fresh dates which he really was very fond of he said that all those who are blessed all those who are blessed will be asked about their blessings on the day of judgment allahumma hasibna hisab yasira 
Hazrat Anas radiyallahu ta'ala and who reports that Prophet sallallahu was very fond of pumpkin in his food. And um, he narrates that once he visited one of his companions and uh, they, as hosts, they uh, presented with the gravy of pumpkins and there was just one dish and Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala and who says that I saw Prophet sallallahu picking up the pieces from his plate and eating it with his hands. How simple and how humble. And then simplicity in the wedding ceremonies. How simple were marriage ceremonies in the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she, when she was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what happened and how did she come to the house of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She was the daughter of the companion of the cave and she was the daughter of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was the first to embrace Islam. How happy the father must have been how overjoyed he must have been at this occasion when he when he knew that his daughter was to enter the house of Prophet ﷺ. But how was her wedding ceremony arranged? She narrates herself that I was just sitting on a swing with my friends that my mother has a Dumiraman Razillahu Ta'ala and her, she came. And she took me off from the swing and with her hairdress, she just wiped my hands and she just cleaned and wiped my face and she took hold of my hand and she just walked with me and she took me and she left me in the courtyard of Prophet Sallallahu And there were some ladies who were, ga- who were just gathered there and they just uh, put some makeup on and they just made me get ready for Prophet Sallallahu And this was all. How simple, how easy and how convenient. And then the marriage of Hazrat Aisha, Hazrat Fatima radiallahu ta'ala and her, the princess of Prophet Sallallahu he, he just conducted the nikah himself. And then after a few days, she was just made to ride a camel, a she camel, and has a Salman Farsi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was just holding the string, and there was a maid servant, a slave maid. She accompanied Hazrat Fatma radiallahu ta'ala anha, and they left her in Hazrat Ali's house. And that was it. That was it. And then in the evening, after offering the Isha Salah, Prophet Sallallahu went to their house and then he asked for a bowl of water and he dipped his fingers in the water and he sprinkled water on his daughter and his son-in-law and then he raised his hand and he made dua. He made dua for the blessings of Allah to be showered on his son, son-in-law and in his daughter and that was all. No bridal dresses, no bridal designer dresses or jewelries, no photo shoots, no color themes, no functions, no music, no dancing, no lighting, no decorations, no stage, no floral arrangements, no food, no functions, no bridal showers, but still the happiest couple, the luckiest couple the most successful family. So after reading and after after learning all this, why should we believe? Why should we assume? And why on the earth should we think that the respect, the regard of our daughters, of our children will be affected when we missed any of what I've talked about, when we missed 
out of any of these things. If the princess of Rahmatullil Alameen, she could just enter that simply in her husband's house without all these customs and still be happy. Why can't our daughters with all, without all these ceremonies be simply, be simply just, just enter their in-laws and enter their husbands' houses. I, I ensure you that Prophet ﷺ said that a marriage which has the least of expenses is the most, is the most successful marriage. And then the apartments of the wives of Prophet ﷺ of the Mahatul Mu'mineen. We know they were all around the courtyard of Masjid Nabi. And they were single, they were just single small rooms. As we learn from the words of the companions, they were just like 8 to 10 cubits long and 6 to 8 cubits wide. And the heights of the rooms were such that the companions narrate that if an adult man of average height just stood and raised his arm, his hands would touch the roof. And there were no doors. The roof was just made out of the branches of the day tree through which sunlight and the rainwater would just also come in. And in Bukhari, Hazrat Abdullah bin Abbas, ta'ala anhu, he explains an occasion. He was the nephew of uh, Umul Mu'mineen, Hazrat Maimuna, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he was also the paternal cousin of Prophet He spent a night at the in the apartment of Hazrat Maimuna, radiallahu ta'ala anha, when it was her turn of Prophet staying with her. And he explains that Prophet and his wife they slept lengthwise. In the apartment, the space was so little that the Prophet ﷺ and his wife, they were sleeping lengthwise in the apartment and I slept across the breadth at their foot end. So we can easily get an idea of the size of the rooms, but despite the shortage of accommodation in the rooms, the mannerism was, was accommodating and there was hospitality and the child was attended with love and affection. Remember when there is space in our hearts, it is not difficult to create space in the rooms and the, in, the how, in the houses. And it is this simplicity of life. It is this simplicity of the life we need to remember in our lives also. So, it was this simplicity of life which Allah was trying to train the Bani Israel into, but they just refused to adopt this simple lifestyle. Now, in the next part of the verse, Allah says, when Hazrat Musa salam asked them, they said that we cannot, we are not content on one kind of food. And then they asked for different types of foods and dishes. And Hazrat Musa said that would you want to exchange what is better for what is less? Then they were suggested, Ihbitu Misran. Ihbitu Misran. Go in any city, in any settlement. Fa'inna lakum masa'altum. And you will have what you've asked for. You will get what you've asked for. Wadhuribat alayhumu dhillatu wal maskana. Waba'u bi'adhabim min Allah. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَيَقْتُلُونَ النَّبِيِّينَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ بِمَا عَسَوْا وَقَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ When they had asked for multiple forms of the worldly dishes, they were then suggested and they were ordered to make jihad and enter into a nearby city and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise them that they will enter the city as conquerors and Allah promised them as victory and what we have already discussed previously the first part of the story 
comes in a later verse and the later part comes in the earlier part of the verse. So now when they were asked what happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Go into a settlement and indeed you will have what you have asked. And they were covered with humiliation and poverty and returned with anger from Allah upon them. And why was all this? That was because they repeatedly disbelieved in the signs and the orders of Allah. And they killed the prophets of Allah without any right. And that was because they disobeyed and they were habitually transgressing. So now in this part of the verse, verse 61, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that when they were thankless and they were ungrateful and they failed to acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings, then they were punished. And in this part, the last part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning three punishments. Three punishments that the people of Bani Israel were given on account of their four behaviors. Three punishments because of four behaviors of Bani Israel. The three punishments were, they were covered with humiliation. Number two, they were, they were, they were subjected to poverty and they were, they returned with the wrath and with the anger and with the curse of Allah. And the three reasons which have been explained in the verse for these three punishments are that they disbelieved in the signs of Allah, in the signs, in the orders, and in the verses of Allah. What did they do? Yakfuruna bi ayatillahi. Ayatillah means what? The signs of Allah, the orders of Allah, and the verses of Allah. They disbelieved, they were disobedient. And then they were killing the prophets of Allah. And they disobeyed Allah and the orders of Allah. And they were in the habit of transgressing that they were transgressors. They disbelieved and they failed to obey the orders. That is when they, when they made a covenant with Allah to obey the Ten Commandments where Hazrat Musa a.s. was given. Then they, they broke the covenant of Allah and they, they, they did disobey Allah. And they killed the prophets like they killed Hazrat Zakriya a.s. Hazrat Zakriya a.s. They, they made a false allegation. The people of Bani Israel, they made a false allegation on Hazrat Zakriya a.s. for illicit relationships with Hazrat Maryam a.s. And then he was stoned to death by them. Astaghfirullah Rabbi. And Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam, they killed Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam. And it was, it was on the asking of the king by his, by his, uh, one of his girlfriends, a prostitute woman who was a dancing girl also. The king was just fond of him and he was, the girl was just his beloved. And when Hazrat Yahya, he talked against illicit and illegal, illegal relationships and he condemned immoral relationships and adultery. So she was offended. And it was on the birthday of the king that she asked the king to behead Hazrat Yahya, now the Billah, and present her with his head as a gift. And she said that then only will she dance for him on his birthday. So as a demand of the Prophet being killed, the king killed Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam. He ordered Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam to be beheaded now, Zubillah. And 
this was all done to please the girlfriend of the king and moreover they also the people of bani israel they also attempted and they planned to kill hazrat musa and to crucify hazrat isa alayhi salam also and they disobeyed allah and they they were transgressors from the norms so these four mannerisms led to the three punishments so if any nation any group of people any family or any society is going to commit these four these four behaviors then the family or the community will be sub- subjected to these three torments of allah now if we analyze the the muslim ummah and the people of pakistan we as a country we are being humiliated the muslim ummah and all the muslim states they are in a state of economic crisis especially pakistan is in a state of total economic crisis the reason is the disbelief the disobedience and the transgression of the muslim ummah allahumma ighfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat allahumma allif bayna qulubihim wa aslih zata baynihim wa ansurhum ala aduvika wa aduvihim allahumma la'anil kafarata allazina yusudduna an sabilik wa yuqadzibuna rusulik wa yuqatiluna awliyaak اللهم خالف بين كلمتهم وزلزل اقدامهم وانزل بهم باسق الذي لا تردوه عن القوم المجرمين امين ثم امين